Good morning, afternoon, or whatever time it is where you are now. My name is Steve Grunwell, and I'm proud to welcome you to WordCamp Kent 2020 Online Edition. Uh, a very special shout out goes to those who are joining us from all over the world who might not even be able to identify Northeast Ohio on a map. Now, obviously, WordCamp Kent being online is a departure from our typical WordCamps. So before we get started, I'd like to commend the, the organizers and the volunteers who had to turn on a dime back in March to restructure the entire event. Um, so if in our independent offices or bedrooms or kitchens or couches, wherever we are right now, if we could take a moment and just clap for the, uh, the organizers, that would be fantastic. I'll wait. Now, obviously, I can't hear you clapping right now, but I'm going to assume people all around the world right now, all 1,200 plus of you right now, are clapping for these organizers, and they absolutely deserve it. I 100% agree with you. Now, thanks to COVID-19, 2020 has been far from business as usual. Um, and honestly, if social distancing isn't the phrase of the year, I'm kind of scared to see what might happen in the back half. I mean, I guess we've been hearing a lot about these murder hornets, right? So sadly, some of us have lost loved ones throughout all of this. But even if we're lucky and haven't lost anyone that we know, pretty much everyone has felt the economic impact. Whether you've lost your job or you've had to shutter your business, or even if your retirement savings just aren't where they are this time last year, it's been tough all over the world. Now, whenever tragedy strikes, someone on Twitter is sure to bring out the old Mr. Rogers bit about looking for the helpers. And yes, we've probably heard it at least a dozen times so far this year, but Mr. Rogers was a huge staple of my childhood. So please, if you'll indulge me. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Now, of course, we can't credit the healthcare professionals on the front lines enough uh, for what they're doing to save lives. Being in a pandemic is hard enough, but when you take that and you multiply it by countries all over the world being so sorely unprepared for this, it's a recipe for disaster, and they have been doing amazing things to protect us all. Now, having been stuck at home since mid-March and generally being a very online person, I've also had a lot of opportunities to see the good and regular people shine through, too. Uh, and I'm not just talking about John Krasinski's Some Good News. Now, if you haven't seen that channel, definitely look it up, um, because it will raise... It's been the highlight of my week, let's just put it that way. But I'm talking about the TikTok videos demonstrating proper hand washing, or the educators who have been posting lesson plans for all of the parents who are now like, I guess I'm homeschooling my kid. There are musicians who have been putting out free concerts on Instagram and on YouTube so that we can retain some small sense of normalcy of what we had before. Online learning tools have been opening up free content to help people learn new skills or, or find new careers. The world that we are entering may look very different than the one we left behind. Now, within the WordPress community, unfortunately, WordCamp Asia had to be canceled due to concerns around the coronavirus. Uh, but a lot of people pay for their own travel for things like WordCamps. So a lot of people were kind of left holding the bag with non-refundable airplane tickets or accommodations or other travel expenses. So we had some heroes within the WordPress community. WordFence, GoDaddy, and Yoast pledged $10,000 a piece to help people who were left with these non-refundable travel costs. That's awesome. For the first time in what feels like forever, people around the world started coming together, bonded together by this global pandemic. Now, a few bad apples aside, we entered April with people working together to flatten the curve and to save lives. The helpers that Mr. Rogers and his mother were talking about, these are the people who have been using their talents, their knowledge, and their resources to help other people. Heck, even just those of us who took the warning seriously and went, well, Guess I'm staying home and not going out to barbecues, not going to restaurants, not getting my hair cut. We've been doing and continue to do our parts. So when David Bertoli reached out and asked if I would give a keynote at WordCamp Kent, I was immediately on board. Uh, WordCamp Kent over the last few years has become kind of my adoptive home WordCamp. And, uh, and not just WordCamp Kent, but Northeast Ohio and WordCamp North Canton before that. We can't forget those. They've long been 
mainstays on my WordCamp schedule. Now, sadly, we're not in person today, but if we were, I'd like to paint you a picture of what it might look like. So imagine we have a couple hundred people sitting in a, a big ballroom that normally would get divided into three smaller rooms for breakout sessions. Out in the hallway, we'd have plenty of natural light coming in through the big windows, and we would have sponsor tables set up, and people would be walking around and talking to the sponsors, yes, but they would also be seeing old friends or uh, meeting new acquaintances. Today being the first day of camp, lunch would likely also be the taco bar. So, WordCamp Kent pro tip, uh, if you want the true WordCamp Kent experience, please, when we break for lunch today, make sure you get yourself a taco. You deserve it. Now I looked it up and the invitation from David arrived on February 17th. So back in the so-called before times, uh, if I recall correctly, I went out to get Chinese food to celebrate because that's how I celebrate these, these occasions. And then the next day I packed up my laptop and I went to my neighborhood coffee shop and I, I worked from the, my nice little counter spot and drank out of my mug because I'm a regular there. Uh, and I'm really, really missing February right now. So David and I started talking about what the keynote might be about. I gave my first keynote last year at WordCamp Dayton, um, and the general premise of that keynote was that software is inherently meaningless. So our job as people making and using software is to either find meaning in what we're doing or find something that does matter. But either way, we need to move forward with empathy. I felt it was a good message, but uh, it may have been a little more tailored toward a developer audience than a general WordPress community crowd. So for this year's WordCamp, I decided uh, to pitch the idea about learning across communities um, because I felt that was an area that a lot of WordCamps had been lacking. Uh, just because we do WordPress, we don't only have to learn from other people within WordPress. Uh, so nobody really knows what our new normal is going to look like as we come out of this. Uh, but hopefully this camp can play some small role in shaping what that new normal for you is going to look like. And if we do our jobs, hopefully you'll come out of it better than you were going into it. So with that, let's talk about the WordPress community as it exists today and where we can draw inspiration to make it even better tomorrow. So the WordPress community is tremendous, uh, to say the least. Before all of this, we had hundreds of WordCamps all over the world. And in addition to the smaller regional WordCamps, like WordCamp Kent, we had these larger camps that were kind of meant to be the mothership for a region. I'm talking WordCamp US, WordCamp Europe, and the aforementioned WordCamp Asia. Now, instead of a few hundred attendees, these camps were set up to accommodate several thousand, and their lineups were a venerable who's who of the biggest names in WordPress from all over the globe. The past few years, we've also seen some more specialized WordPress conferences pop up. Uh, WP Campus comes to mind, and that's focused on people who are using WordPress in a higher education setting. We have LoopConf, and that's focused on a more developer-oriented crowd. So how can we write the most performant stuff? How can we do deep dives into WPCLI, things of that nature? We also have Pressnomics, and Pressnomics is more about the people who are running their businesses on top of WordPress, literally the economy of WordPress. Another more niche conference is WordCamp for Publishers. Now this one is more oriented toward journalists and bloggers and other people who are regularly publishing content using WordPress. Topics would include things like publishing workflows, syndication, content moderation, uh, things of that nature. One of the cool things about WordCamp for Publishers is that it also moves around the United States. So it started in Denver back in 2017. It moved to Chicago in 2018, and then it landed in my home city of Columbus, Ohio in 2019. Now I've lived in Columbus most of my life. So even though I don't do a lot with publishing day to day anymore, I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to have all of these big names in WordPress show up at, in the city that I know and love. I wanted to show them around. I wanted to show them like, hey, Columbus is awesome. Little did I know, WordCamp for Publishers 2019 was also where I would meet my new friend, Rebecca, who perhaps taught me the most valuable lesson of the entire camp. 
let me tell you. So first day of camp, we're sitting around uh, at a table full of strangers. You know, we go around, we're introducing ourselves, uh, which by the way, this is one of my favorite things to do at conferences. Um, next time you're able to actually go be in person at a conference, just strike up a conversation with a person sitting next to you at the the breakfast table or, or whatever, because you never know who you're going to be sitting next to um, or the, the kind of people that you'll meet. So anyway, this circle eventually reaches my new friend, Rebecca. And uh, as it turns out, Rebecca is another Columbus resident and she does social media work for the Columbus Dispatch. For those outside of the area, uh, the Dispatch is the second largest newspaper in the state of Ohio. Um, and it's also the place where my wife worked for about two, two and a half years after graduating college. So I ask what brought Rebecca, who is a Kent State graduate, by the way, uh, to WordCamp for Publishers, because the last I had heard, the dispatch was using this big proprietary enterprise-y uh, content management system uh, for publishing. And I was like, last I heard you're using this nightmare. Are you, are you considering a move to WordPress? And she assured me that they are still using the nightmare CMS. To be clear, my words, not hers. Uh, but they try to keep up with what's happening uh, on other platforms so that they can make informed decisions. After all, a good idea is a good idea, regardless of the platform. So as she saw it, anything that she could learn uh, from what's going on in WordPress, she could bring back and they could potentially apply to the platform they're using. Now, even after attending WordCamp for Publishers, I don't know that Rebecca would really consider herself a member of the WordPress community, but she was practicing the very thing I'm here to encourage you to do today, which is to look outside of your, your immediate area to explore, learn, and grow. Now, the WordPress community is not a one-size-fits-all situation. We have different subgroups of the WordPress community that are going to be more specialized. For instance, I'm a developer who does a lot of work with WordPress, so that makes me a WordPress developer. Okay. Uh, I also have published and maintained several plugins in the uh, WordPress.org plugin repository. So that makes me a WordPress plugin developer. I also contribute to and regularly write WPCLI commands. So that makes me a WPCLI developer. These are all subsets of that WordPress developer category, which is a subset in itself of the WordPress community. Everyone following so far? Now, just because someone's a say, WordPress developer, that doesn't mean that they're going to have the same interests or skills as other members of that community. For instance, I don't really build themes anymore. I did a lot of that when I was doing agency stuff, but now that I'm working more on the product side, I don't spend much time building themes. Other people love building Gutenberg blocks, for instance, and I would... You know what? Moving on. These are only the micro communities, though. In the same way, we have the more macro communities. Again, being a software developer, that means that I'm part of the larger software development community, the same one as the people who are building mobile apps in Swift or the people who are maintaining COBOL applications that were written before I was born. Now, WordPress is written in PHP. That's the underlying programming language. So you're automatically, as a WordPress developer, part of that larger PHP community. And in fact, I went the other way. I landed in WordPress because I was doing a lot of PHP. I was working at a shop where we did a lot of PHP content management systems. And my boss went, hey, uh, instead of building this one custom, WordPress uses PHP. Let's try that out for this client. And then I just kind of never left. I probably shouldn't say this at a WordCamp. Uh, so if the feed gets cut, please suspect foul play. But I get way more enjoyment out of building things in platforms like Laravel, which is a completely separate PHP application development framework more than I do building WordPress plugins or themes. But my career has been centered around WordPress. My friends, most of them, are in WordPress in some way. So here I am at a WordCamp talking about WordPress because we are more than just members of the WordPress community. It's been said that if all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And I think we can say the same thing about WordPress. If all you have or all you know is WordPress, then every problem kind of starts looking like a WordPress problem. Now, don't get me wrong. 
WordPress is an incredibly flexible tool. I've seen and helped people do some ridiculous things with it, but you want to make sure that you're using the right tool for the job. If you need a publishing platform or you need to build, say, a marketing site and your clients need to be able to go in and easily update content, WordPress, definitely. If you need to build a store and you want more control over it and you don't want to risk paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars a month to someone like Shopify, WooCommerce is a fantastic alternative. Training courses, booking engines, media galleries, and more are powered by WordPress every single day without breaking a sweat. Now, on the other hand, let's say you need to build a private API to power a mobile application. Yes, you could probably register a bunch of custom post types and then just strip out the stuff you don't need. You'll likely need to deal with stuff like authentication. Uh, you might need more robust logging. Uh, and background processes, I mean, you don't really want to use WP Cron for that. That's not what it's designed for. And then there are the performance considerations, of course, uh, since WordPress is going to be spinning up on each and every request, but you could probably mitigate that with some pretty extensive caching. This is all to say WordPress can do just about anything, but that doesn't mean it's always going to be that right tool for the job. WordPress's goal is to democratize publishing. It's not necessarily to be the backbone of mobile applications. WordPress is only one of many tools in your toolbox, but you need to know enough to know that the other tools exist. Now, just because we spend our time as members of the WordPress community, that doesn't mean that we can only create WordPress-based solutions. Some of the best WordPress developers I know, for instance, are not WordPress developers. They don't consider themselves WordPress developers, but they're software developers who work with different technologies, whether those are other things in the PHP community or are working with things like Ruby or Python or .NET, they have this vast knowledge and then they know when it's okay to push WordPress to get something done and when it's best to look to these other tools. Let's get away from developers though, because I tend to kind of hover around that. You know, we speak to what we know. Um, but instead, let's focus more on the people who are using the software. Let's say, for instance, I'm just going to pick a random product that's in no way topical. You're selling handmade masks using a WooCommerce storefront. Um, now, this is obviously a hot market right now. So you need to do everything that you can to ensure that your store is going to rank higher than the competition. Now, if you're like me, your first instinct might be to go to Google or DuckDuckGo and search for improve WooCommerce search rankings. And you're going to get a whole list of plugins and services telling you, oh, we can get you to number one on all the search engines. Now, first, let's dial back those expectations a little bit. Selling a commodity item during a global pandemic, especially for a newer store, it's going to be an uphill battle if you want to get to that number one spot. But more importantly, let's go back to that original query, improve WooCommerce search rankings. Maybe we drop WooCommerce from that or we just simply replace it with store, improving store search rankings. That's going to open the field of knowledge, the, the pool from which your answers can be drawn to things across platforms, um, all different SEO communities. Now, here's the trick about search engine optimization. Google and friends, they don't care if you're using WooCommerce or if you're using Shopify or Magento or Wix. The rules aren't going to change based on the platform, but there are a bunch of factors that are going to be consistent that you need to be aware of. So maybe instead of asking, how can I solve this problem in WordPress? Try exploring the solution to the problem, period. Then figure out how to implement that within WordPress, whether it's installing a plugin or uh, subscribing to a service or hiring somebody to build it if it doesn't already exist within WordPress. Or if you're able, create it yourself. These are how some of the most important WordPress plugins have come about. People see a need and they build it. So the former search, remember improve WooCommerce search rankings, that might get you somewhere quicker. But the latter, improve store search rankings, having that context and understanding that's what's going to set you up for long-term success. Now, for example, let's say you find a service that offers to boost your store's search rankings by, let's say, increasing the number of inbound links to your site. Now, those who don't deal with SEO um, and might not be the ones cringing right now, 
inbound links, uh, those are the links on other domains that point back to your site. So let's say search engines are going about and they're crawling the web and they see a bunch of different sites that are pointing back to your site saying, these are the most beautiful and comfortable masks that I have ever worn in my life. Those search engines, they're going to see you as being reputable and therefore worthy of those higher rankings. The sad reality though, is that buying inbound links is absolutely like 100% of the time going to be a scam. You might see a temporary gain, but you're likely going to end up worse off than where you started because the search engines see, oh no, this person's trying to pull a fast one on us. And then you end up falling lower in the ranks because you tried to lie and cheat your way up. Now, if you had done some light research on SEO, remember just optimizing store practices. How can I get more customers' eyeballs on my store? You might have read dozens of warnings about, hey, by the way, if someone tries to sell you inbound links, it's a scam, run away, don't do it. You would have also turned up dozens of checklists of things like, hey, here are the high, medium, and low priority things that most sites will need to address if they want more traffic to their, their e-commerce store. The kicker is that these checklists might not be prepared by people who are, say, hanging out in the WooCommerce space. They might be people who are working on Magento or consulting across all of the e-commerce platforms. Or maybe these are coming from SEO specialists who their market are people who are selling on Etsy or eBay, and they're just trying to optimize those listings. Again, it doesn't matter what platform you're using. Those rules don't change. So understand the problem you're trying to solve, then determine how best to solve that problem. Finally, then you can figure out how to implement that solution within the context of WordPress or within WooCommerce. That order is going to let you avoid the most common pitfalls, as well as discover what questions to ask and then make well-informed decisions about your business. Maybe not everybody knows this, but each release of WordPress is named after a different jazz musician. Uh, for instance, WordPress 3.2 was nicknamed Gershwin to honor George Gershwin. John Coltrane had 2.7, Ella Fitzgerald was 2.1, and Miles Davis kicked off the whole shebang with WordPress version 1.0. Now, WordPress releases being named after jazz musicians, that's rather appropriate because both WordPress and jazz are built around the idea of improvisation. Don't believe me? If you recall from our official WordCamp Kent history textbooks, uh, should have been mailed to you, WordPress began as a fork of the B2 publishing platform way back in 2003. Uh, Mike Little and Matt Mullenweg took B2 and they built it out into a little blogging platform that we know today as WordPress. In the early days, WordPress was all about that blog. You visit a WordPress site and you see a reverse chronological list of posts. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. For those of us at a WordCamp, definitely something we've seen before, right? But that set the stage for what was to come. Before long, we got plugins and themes and the concept of pages. These weren't things that members of the WordPress community had seen elsewhere on other platforms. And they went, huh, that would be useful. I wonder if we can get that worked into WordPress. How can we incorporate that into what we love about WordPress? These were the first hints of WordPress embracing its future of becoming something more than just a blogging engine. Now, keep in mind, this was also back in 2005, so we still have 15 years of history to cover. WordPress continued iterating, experimenting, and improvising. Uh, WordPress 3.0 in the summer of 2010 and the first really useful implementation of custom post types and custom taxonomies. Now, if you're not a developer or you're not familiar with those terms, custom post types are what let WooCommerce have products and orders or event calendars have events. They're different types of content. Then custom taxonomies, those help us tie all of these moving pieces together. These items are so fundamental to WordPress as we know it today that 10 years later in 2020, WordCamps will still regularly feature intro to custom post types and custom taxonomy type talks. Now, over the course of about seven years from 03 to 2010, WordPress had grown from just this little blogging platform to a full-fledged content management system, able to handle much more complex sites. 
Now, this wasn't necessarily due to any grand plan somewhere, but rather folks working on WordPress would look to other communities. They would say, hey, I was building this site and then I had to build a Drupal site for this other client. And uh, I went, hey, that seems like a really cool idea. Or I was working uh, in this .NET CMS and I went, ooh, it would be really cool if we had that. So people would go out and they would say, what is something that I have seen or used elsewhere that WordPress is missing? And then they would bring these ideas back and we would improvise and we'd figure out how to implement them within WordPress. Now, the next big improvisation came with post formats in 2011. If you haven't used post formats before, um, you're not alone. I, I don't think they ever really took off the way that the core team probably envisioned, but it showed that WordPress was willing to look beyond WordPress and draw inspiration and then improvise. Now, 2011, it's worth mentioning, also saw the first release of an e-commerce plugin uh, known as JigoShop. Uh, now, JigoShop leveraged custom post types uh, that had been introduced the year before in 2010 uh, in order to add e-commerce capabilities into WordPress. JigoShop was eventually forked by a company called WooThemes. You can probably see where this is going, becoming the foundation of what we know as WooCommerce today. So I felt like that was a notable milestone because now we have a blogging platform that's grown to power e-commerce storefronts and marketing sites often without any blog component at all. So we've already kind of said, you know what, we can do pages, we can do e-commerce without even having to do this core thing that back in 2003 was the only thing that WordPress did. This is all because someone saw a great idea somewhere else and decided to figure out how to improvise and make it work within WordPress. So then WordPress kept growing and iterating. Uh, the WP REST API arrived in WordPress 4.7, and that gave developers a new way to interact with WordPress. So from headless sites to powering mobile apps, the REST API fundamentally changed the way that people thought about WordPress and its content. Now, the latest major innovation on the WordPress front was the block editor, aka Gutenberg. Now, some of the leads on the project, they were looking around and they were enamored with the block editing experiences on platforms like Medium and Ghost. And they were like, how can we bring this kind of experience into WordPress? Speaking from personal experience, publishers have been clamoring for this too. They wanted that solid page builder experience that didn't rely on short codes or didn't mean, okay, great, we're going to have some custom meta box set up. Uh, and we're forever locked into this. And if we ever want to, you know, swap out and go to say Beaver Builder, for instance, we'd completely have to rebuild every single page that was built using this proprietary thing. Now we have a nice standard thing because people stretched outside of WordPress. Now, I mean, no disrespect to any of the core contributors, but a lot of these major innovations within WordPress, again, were not ideas that were original to WordPress. They weren't necessarily on a roadmap back in 2003. And I don't think that the core team, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think the core team sits in isolation chambers and uh, put on blinders to be completely oblivious to the outside world. Things like content management systems, microblogging, e-commerce, REST APIs, block editors, these all exist outside of WordPress too. But WordPress took these ideas, they put a spin on it, and now they make up WordPress as we know it today. WordPress is the direct result of seeing what worked well outside of WordPress and then drawing those inspirations inward. And that's why I feel that the jazz comparison is apt. Music, especially styles of music that are heavily driven by improvisation, things like jazz and blues, it's all about borrowing ideas from your influences. It could be a riff here or a melody there, and you bring them together to create something new. Sometimes it's not even intentional. A guitarist might be jamming with his friends and not be thinking, oh, this is a riff I picked up listening to the uh, Buddy Guy album, you know, 12 years ago while they're jamming. But subconsciously, our brains, they're picking these things up and they're remixing them in our heads. They're twisting them about and they spit them out in cool new ways. So remember, a good idea is a good idea, regardless of the platform. The more we can learn from each other's successes and failures, our strengths and weaknesses, the further we can all go together. So don't be afraid to improvise or to make mistakes. Let your brain collect these little nuggets and ideas from all over and turn them into something big. Now, when we talk about knowledge, we can generally talk about it in two ways. 
we have the number of things you have some degree of knowledge about, so the breadth, and how well you understand particular things, or the depth. So if we were to plot these on a graph, it might look something like this. We have the x-axis, the number of things that we know. So whether these are things in our field, life skills, facts about our favorite TV shows, etc. But then we have the y-axis, right? How well we understand each of those things, that depth of knowledge. Now, a really wide breadth of knowledge is generally going to put us into the generalist or jack of all trades territory, where you know a little bit about a lot of things, but you lack really deep knowledge in any one area. The inverse can also be true though. You get the people who are hyper-specialized, the people who can tell you absolutely everything about a business practice or a technology, or maybe even something like a period in history. They have this really deep knowledge, but they might be blissfully unaware of so many things. Now, for very particular roles, being hyper-specialized could be super useful. If, for instance, you are a brilliant virologist, but you don't know the first thing about, like, cooking or cleaning, I bet I'm not the only one who would volunteer to come to your house and cook for you and clean for you if you it meant that you could use your vast, deep knowledge of virology to kick COVID to the curb. Please, if this is you, and for some reason you're watching this keynote, email me. Conversely, it can be really useful to have one or two generalists on your team. You don't want a full team of them, but having those utility players, the people who can wear multiple hats or be able to point you in the direction if you have an idea and you need to flesh that out, um, they might be able to guide you. Now, the trick with all of this is that we don't have an unlimited capacity for knowledge. There's only a finite amount of time and energy that we have to absorb this stuff. And of course, different people are going to learn differently and at different speeds, but there are not enough hours in the day to learn everything about everything. That's important. You need to pick and choose what's going to be important to us. So for most of us, we're probably going to want to lie somewhere in between that hyper-specialized and the generalist. Uh, we want a good balance of breadth and depth. We want deep knowledge in a few different areas, but we want to make sure that we're also aware of the world around us. For instance, if you are running a business, you probably want to have a pretty deep understanding of your customers' needs or how you're positioned within the marketplace, who your major competitors are. You probably also want to have at least a little bit of understanding about things like marketing and finances because those are kind of important. Even if all you really know about those is enough to say, I don't like this stuff. I don't want to learn more about this stuff. I would rather pay someone who is good at it or who does specialize in it to handle it for me. For the creatives, uh, you might know everything about, say, color theory or typography. But if you're designing something that's meant to be interacted with, I would hope that you would at least have cursory understanding of things like user experience and accessibility, because these are important things. But the developers, you don't have to be that mythical unicorn developer. If it's easier for you to say, you know what, a front-end framework is going to be, let me actually do my job better than it would be to sit down and learn absolutely everything there is to know about CSS. That's totally fine. And if you don't want to deal with setting up and maintaining servers, you might look at managed hosting options. I don't know, Nexus comes to mind. The real challenge is finding the bits of knowledge that are going to be tangential to your work, the things that aren't your specialty per se, but they can take your work from just okay or good to great or amazing. For my site owners, these are going to be things like copywriting and SEO. Does your copy grab your reader's attention or does it just kind of fall flat? Does it fit your brand or is it the kind of thing where, well, the site's going to launch and we don't have any copy for the about page. So someone put something together pretty quickly. It's fine. It's passable, but it's not winning any awards. It's not attracting anyone's attention. Um, it just kind of slipped through and no one's had the, the nerve to go change it. Let me show you an example. With the run on toilet paper at the start of the pandemic, a lot of people started investigating bidets as an alternative. And yes, I'm about to talk about bidets during a WordCamp keynote because again, 2020 is a strange and different world. So if you haven't seen or used one before, a bidet is either a standalone fixture or an attachment for your toilet. 
and it uses water to clean you up after you finish doing um, <clears throat> your business. You now, these are extremely common across the world, especially places like Europe and Asia, but they've never really taken off stateside. Now, I would like to tell you today about two different bidets. First, we have the Lux Neo series of bidets. Now, these are some of the top sellers on Amazon. Um, they're pretty affordable, and the average reviews are hovering right around, say, four and a half to five stars. So, you know, pretty solid. Um, the product itself looks very much like a medical appliance you might see in a, a hospital or in your grandparents' house. But sure, given those ratings uh, and the number of reviews, it, it's probably a product that people are pretty happy with. Their website, on the other hand, well, could probably use some work. The first paragraph on their about page reads, Lux Bidet was started as a direct result of a problem encountered by its founder. After purchasing a basic bidet for his parents' bathroom, he found that there were many issues with it. Unattractive design, low-quality fittings, substandard valves, and absent customer support. In 2008, Dr. Gupta set out to fix the problem, and Lux Bidet was born. Their about page is very... Matter of fact, yes, bidets save paper, they're less abrasive than TP, they're better for your septic systems, they save money, etc., etc. It's objective, and it's full of good information, but that doesn't exactly make you excited at the prospect of spending $60 to $100 or more on a bidet. Now, let's look at one of their competitors, Tushy. Now, Tushy sells a very similar product but their copywriting sells it so much better. You know that old adage, if a bird pooped on you, would you wipe it off with dry paper or would you wash it with water? Oh, you never heard of it? Cool, cool, cool. But think about it. Water is the best way to clean just about everything. Our dishes, our sick cars, our hair, and body. So wouldn't it make sense to clean our butts after we poop? Yeah. In the first paragraph. We have two uses of the word poop, one of the word but, and I get to use both in order to make a point during a keynote. Once again, 2020 is a very, very strange year. Now, according to the title of a seminal reading for any parents of young children such as myself, everyone poops. But it's one of those things that we just don't talk about. Like, it's something to be ashamed of. Now, while Lux Bidet uses safe, sterile language like health, hygiene, and derriere, I'm not kidding about that one. It's in there. Tushy realizes that people aren't used to or even really comfortable talking about this thing, which, again, is something that every human being does. So instead, they decided to subvert the rules of quote-unquote safe marketing, and they put that stuff front and center. Their site includes phrases including, protect your booty from infection and disease, poop happens, no more skid marks, and hashtag green bum. The copy on the Tushy site is absolutely 100% tongue-in-cheek, because that's the kind of writing you need when your business model is literally, well, let's see, every human alive today does this, uh, so maybe we don't take it so seriously? Take it from me. Humor is hard. And there's a very fine line between being cheeky and funny and just being crass or immature. But a good copywriter is going to be able to toe that line. Now, let's say that you're building a WooCommerce store to sell bidets because, again, there's a big market for them right now. Would you feel confident in your ability to write that kind of copy? Probably not, right? But if you understand the value of good copywriting, that might lead you to find copywriters who do understand how to maintain that balance and make your customers actually want to read, like look forward to reading about a bidet. The same can be said for SEO. You don't have to be an expert or spend hours poring over the latest SEO research because there are already thousands of people who do that same thing every single day. But just knowing, A, enough to know that you need help, B, the right questions to ask, and C, the right terms to search. These are things that will help you find the people or the tools to help you fill in those gaps when you need to. 
Now, I'm not generally a fan of the phrase, you don't know what you don't know, but this is like the one situation where it totally fits. If you're willing to look outside of your focus area, you will be a better person for it. You will be better at whatever your job or your passion is because you're aware of what's going on. It's situational awareness for knowing stuff, which is pretty cool. So let's do another example. And I promise this one has nothing to do with bidets. We are done with bidets. Thank you for humoring me. We know, for instance, that one of the big factors that determine whether or not a customer is going to buy something from your e-commerce store is how fast that page loads. Now, assume these people don't know anything about you. They arrived on your site through organic search. They were typing, I want to find whatever product and your store came up, other stores came up, they clicked yours. If your store is taking more than, say, six seconds to load, there's a very high likelihood that they are going to go somewhere else. And let's be honest, that's probably going to be Amazon. In fact, the general rule of thumb is about 2.5 seconds for page load. Anything more than that and customers are going to be likely to bounce. So remember, 2.5 seconds is that sweet spot. Um, And they're definitely going to bounce if they can get the same product elsewhere. If you're not selling something that's absolutely unique and you have competitors who are making the same or similar things, worse than that, over that 2.5 second threshold, studies have shown that you see about a 7% decrease in conversion rates for every second of delay. So 3.5 seconds, say bye-bye to an extra 7%. 4.5 seconds, great, 14%, gone. Your site being slow is costing you money. Now, search engines will kick you when you're down because they'll penalize slower sites too. Slower sites will lead to lower rankings. Lower rankings mean you get less organic traffic. It's a double whammy. But just knowing these facts gives you a big leg up. If you know that your conversion rates aren't what you want them to be and that your site is taking, say, 8 to 10 seconds to load, knowing that, hey, this poor performance is directly impacting conversions, that's a great place to start. So you can go and you can solve that problem. Understanding the benefits of organic search traffic on conversions also mean that you know that if you're not ranking well, maybe you want to talk to somebody who specializes in SEO. You don't need to become a performance engineer or an SEO specialist. That's not your job. But collecting these little bits of knowledge mean that you'll be able to ask the right questions and find the right solutions. The best part is the fundamentals, whether it's user experience or SEO, accessibility, copywriting, again, they don't care if you're using WordPress or if you're selling on WooCommerce or if you're using something like Shopify or Wix or Squarespace or Magento or any other platform. Remember, if you're running a WooCommerce store and you're trying to sell something, you're not just competing with other people with WooCommerce stores selling that same or similar thing. There are stores running on Big Commerce or Shopify or something like Wix or Squarespace, and they're all competing for that those same search positions and those same customers. So why would you limit yourself to only learning how to market within the confines of WooCommerce? Why not go broader and learn what drives conversions regardless of e-commerce platform? It doesn't matter if you're reading an article about improving e-commerce conversions from a Shopify blog. In fact, they have some pretty great content. Or you might be learning how to optimize a database query from a Drupal developer. Doesn't matter. It's the same principle. Everything that we do is connected by these underlying fundamentals. So if we can learn something from, say, someone selling on Magento about how to improve your WooCommerce store, that's great. Heck, they might be learning a thing or two from us talking about WooCommerce, and that's cool too. So if you remember my friend Rebecca that I told you about, she is super smart. She's already ahead of the curve. She's doing these things. And while the Columbus Dispatch might not be using WordPress, they are still a publisher, which means that they're competing for eyeballs against other publishers who may very well be using WordPress. So by taking the time to listen and explore new ideas, Rebecca's able to see what others are doing well, and she's able to form those questions that she might not have ever considered to ask. Remember that WordPress makes up about 35% of the web today, which is outstanding, but that still means about two thirds of the web is not WordPress. We would be doing ourselves a disservice if we just ignored 
everything else when there's so much more to learn. Again, these are weird and strange times that we're living in. So one of the best things that you can do, especially if unfortunately you might find yourself with a little more free time than you did back in January, is spend more time exploring things outside your immediate area of expertise. Whether that's reading more blogs or listening to more podcasts or taking advantage of online courses, open yourself to learning about the things that have been hanging just in your periphery. Best yet, we're just starting day one of WordCamp Kent. So today and tomorrow, they're going to be full of great talks, full of content from all over the spectrum. So whether it's lead generation or SEO, client management or photo editing, there's going to be something here at this camp that you can learn and use. So personally, I can't wait to pour myself a fresh cup of coffee, sit back and enjoy them all. We might not have the taco bar here today, but we have each other. And you know what? That's what matters most. So please sit back, enjoy, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you so much. Have an excellent WordCamp, Kent.